Okay, good afternoon. Thanks everyone for coming out uh, on a, a little bit of a dreary day, but we're gonna have uh, an important and uh, exciting conversation on nuclear operations, managing US nuclear operations to make the best of today. Uh, my name is Alyssa Ayers and I'm Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs. I'm very happy to welcome you all. Uh, as you know, we are here to celebrate the launch of this volume, Managing U.S. Nuclear Options in the 21st Century, which is out just a couple months ago uh, from Brookings Institution Press. This book represents a remarkable multi-year and collaborative effort to bring civilian and military leaders together to map out a framework for U.S. nuclear strategy since the end of the Cold War. Tackling everything from the nuts and bolts of how nuclear attack options would be transmitted, to those tasked with carrying them out, to what sorts of options would be transmitted, oh, sorry, to what sorts of options might be available to a commander in chief. The book is sure to be a must read, especially for a new generation of nuclear policy professionals who have entered the field in the post Cold War moment. Now, for those of you who don't know, and I hope many of you do, uh, there are three parts to our mission here at the Elliott School. First, to educate the next generation of international leaders. Second, to conduct research and produce scholarship that advances understanding of important global issues. And third, to engage the public and the policy community in the United States and around the world, thereby fostering international dialogue and shaping policy solutions. I think you'll see and you will hear today that this book truly embodies that mission by bringing scholars together with decorated senior military officials and policymakers to examine an issue that's critical to US and to global security. We have two important notes of thanks. First, to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their generous support of this work, which, as many of you know, began under the vision and leadership of the late, great Jan Nolan. The Carnegie Corporation has been a terrific partner to the Elliott School, and we are grateful for their support. Second, Professor Charlie Glazer, who selflessly stepped in to lead this project after Jan's passing, and he has done an incredible job seeing it to fruition. Now, I think for all of us in the room, Professor Charlie Glazer needs no introduction, but I am honored to offer one. Uh, I will offer one briefly before turning over the proceedings of the day to him. He is Professor of Political Science and International Affairs here at the Elliott School, where he was the founding director of the Institute for Security and Conflict Studies from 2009 to 2019, and he now is the co-director Previously, Professor Glazer was the Emmett Dedman Professor of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. His books, well known, include Rational Theory of International Politics, published in 2010, and Analyzing Strategic Nuclear Policy, 1990. In 2018, he was awarded the International Studies Association Security Studies Section's Distinguished Scholar Award. In 2021, he was awarded the National Academy of Sciences William and Catherine Estes Award for Behavioral Research for the prevention of nuclear war. He holds both an MA in physics and an MPP from Harvard University in addition to his PhD from the Kennedy School of Government. So as I believe you're all aware, he's had an enormous impact on the security studies field and in particular in thinking about the use of nuclear weapons as his publications and accolades attest. So we are in the best of hands for today's discussion and I will now turn everything over to Professor Glazer. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and also um, to all of you in the audience for coming out today. Um, I'm going to give much briefer introductions because we have a very, very full program. What we're going to do today is we're going to start with brief comments from the editors of the volume, and then we're going to have um, much more extended comments from three of the um, chapter authors. Unfortunately, Frank Miller, who was scheduled to be here today, um, could not make it. Um, so we're going to start um, with Brian Rudzinski who is now a senior fellow at the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, and then comments by Austin Long, who is the Deputy Director for Strategic Stability in the Joint Staff, J5, which is Strategy, Plans, and Policy. So Brian, over to you. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks. Thanks. It's good to see all of you here today. It's good to be back at the LA School. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about how this book got started and, and why Jan thought it was an important project to do and why we thought it was important to finish it after her passing um, a couple of years ago. Um, so, when I, so when we started this project, I was, I was Jan's research assistant. I was a PhD student in the program. Um, across the hall here, and it tells you a little bit about how long ago that was. <laughs> I've now managed to transcend PhD status to, to full-time employment. Um, 
it does happen. Um, so, so, so when we started this book, it was it was a complicated time in, in U.S. foreign policy and national security. Um, at the, the end, final years of the Obama administration, um, there was a recognition that the U.S.-China relationship was becoming more, um, you might say, competitive or, or more challenging. Um, there were concerns about Russia's compliance with arms control agreements, and there was a lot more discussion about um, about nuclear weapons and, and facing nuclear nuclear armed challengers and, and how to manage that those, those challenges in a way that that um, that that both advanced sort of national interests but also created opportunities for for arms control and cooperation and 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 and, and um, non military solutions to those challenges and and as these issues kind of started percolating up into the public conversation, um, Jan sort of harkened back to an animating sort of set of ideas in her career that she always kind of tried to, to explore in her work. The first, the first sort of one of these themes is, is the tension between um, nuclear weapons and the requirements of nuclear deterrence and the fact that we live in a democracy in which the public is supposed to have a say about what its leaders decide. Um, and the problem is that, that nuclear weapons are complex, that managing them requires a degree of secrecy. And what that means is that we place a lot of trust when we elect a president uh, to make those decisions on behalf of the national interest. And yet nuclear issues are almost never in presidential debates. When they are, they're very high level. Um, most members of the public don't really engage with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. And what that means is that decisions that have to get made, that must get made, get end up made by experts um, rather than sort of a, a, an idealized version of the way that democracy is supposed to go. And so Jan recognized that in, in, this, in this kind of world, knowledge and information are power. And, and what, what she tried to do with this book was to try to spread the wealth around a little bit, to give people the tools to engage in an informed way rather than a politicized way about, about these really important questions. Um, which is which sort of suggests the second tension in Jan's work, which is um, the alternative to having experts make decisions is having elected leaders make decisions. And having worked in the Congress, she was really skeptical that you could do this in any kind of practicable way. Um, she doubted that the Congress is sort of the way it was at the time had the temperament and the expertise to make nuclear policy. That was another big theme of her work. And she saw this book as another way to um, put information in the hands of of people who could prepare elected leaders to have more informed conversations on these issues. Um, and, and while she recognized that we couldn't, you know, this is, this is, this is not a problem that has a clear solution. It is something that we all sort of have to work through constantly. One thing we can do as academics, and one thing that she could do as a, as a sort of scholar and, and well-known analyst is to write a book. Um, and we took inspiration from a book, Austin will say more about this, a book that happened that was put together in the 1980s um, that covered these subjects and like like that book, this book was also an experiment. Um, it brought together people who do not write edited volume chapters for a living. They do, they do other important things. Um, they, they work in a culture that, um, for which security sensitive information is really important um, and, and for which uh, sort of putting things on paper is, is requires a, a fair amount of sort of constitutional effort. And so, she brought together her immense charisma and knowledge and connections and tried to get together a group of informed people who could try to speak to these different, different challenges. Um, and, it, and it was a, a long and difficult process and, and she thought it was really important and the Carnegie Corporation generously funded her to do that. When she passed, we all sort of agreed that it was important to do this. It, it, it became more important um, in the latter half of the, the, the 2010s when um, these issues became even more central to our Kind of national conversations, and and we thought it would be not just a, an important thing to do for its own sake, but also a fitting tribute to Jan to see this book through the end, and and, and it's great to be here today and, and see it out of print. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. So I have to say what I usually say in these settings, which is, uh, despite being a government official, I'm here speaking in a personal capacity. Uh, anything you hear from me is my own view, and not that of the Department of Defense, Joint Staff, or anybody. That said, before I was a government official, I was an academic. Um, and the volume that uh, Brian mentioned, Managing Nuclear Operations, came out from Brookings in 1987. And for a certain type of, of scholar, for a certain type of academic, it was it was the Bible and it was you know, biblical in length. 
Um, and it was a great teaching tool because it, it did what Brian referred to, which is it provided as much information about nuclear operations, planning, et cetera, as you could share in an unclassified setting. Much of, uh, much of what uh, we do in nuclear operations and planning is rightly classified and has to remain so, but uh, the public does need to understand. People that write about nuclear weapons, even if they don't have a TSSCI blah, blah, blah clearance, they should be able to, to speak intelligently about it. So that was an invaluable tone. However, when I was teaching it in the late 2000s, early 2010s, it was showing its age. And the, the point I made to Jan is when we sort of started this was there was a chapter talking about um, nuclear operations and planning tools. And it has a sentence that I'm going to slightly paraphrase that was like, and one day, children, everyone will have a computer at their desk in this far <laughs> fanciful future time. Yeah, okay. The, the time that time had come. Uh, and so I, I went I went to Jan and one of um, one of the many events she had trying to bring together folks to establish bipartisan understanding of, of nuclear weapons. And I said, you know, this is a really valuable book, and I still teach it, but it's it's showing its age. Do you think we could do anything to update it? And then everything Brian said is right. Um, for those of you that know Jan, uh, immensely charismatic, energetic, entrepreneurial, uh, able to get things done. Uh, and she was she was seized by the idea for all the reasons Brian said. Um, and unlike me, she can actually make things happen. So uh, she started deploying her her network and her energies towards this end. Um, and managed to, to pull along a very distinguished set of, of authors. Um, as, as Brian said, Charlie stepped in after her passing to sort of continue momentum because Lord knows Brian and I weren't going to do it. So all the, all the credit is due is due to Charlie on that. Um, but I, I think that what we have in, in this volume is maybe not quite as biblical. It's certainly not the same length as the previous book. We don't cover some of the same topics, but we cover many of the same topics, uh, which the speakers today will address. Um, and I think we, we have done fitting tribute to Jan and to the original volume in terms of, of updating this understanding to the extent it's possible um, for, the, for the public and for scholars. So with that, I'll turn it to Charlie. Thank you. I would just say um, that there's still actually much in that initial volume that is quite valuable analytically, um, including a couple very important chapters and very good chapters by um, Ash Carter, who unfortunately passed away um, recently. Um, but I do think that our volume nicely complements it. What I want to do now is, without doing justice to the other chapters, we're going to get extensive comments on three chapters. I'm just going to sort of give you like the bullet line on the other chapters so you have some sense of what's actually in the book. Um, so Brian and I wrote a, um, a rather long chapter that's designed to give a foundation for people who are not up to their ears in this all the time, which lays out the basics of nuclear deterrence theory, what forces we have, a uh, broad level, how we operate them, um, and some of the history of, of US um, targeting doctrine. Then there are two hit, um, chapters that are about the history of US targeting, um, but really focus on the role of the interactions between civilians and military officials in translating high level civilian guidance into the war plans. And two, couldn't have two more qualified people. So Frank Miller's chapter um, basically covers you know, it's a short chapter, but it covers from the beginning of nuclear targeting up through um, the Bush administration, the first Bush administration. Um, and he explains in there about the gap between um, the, top, the guidance and the actual plans. Um, and then to some extent, how those gaps were narrowed, if not eliminated um, in um, the Reagan and Bush years. Um, and he doesn't emphasize it, but in important ways due to his own contributions. Um, and then um, Jim Miller's chapter picks up um, in the Obama administration and talks about um, the um, targeting review in the Obama administration. And he sort of continuing in the theme of Frank Miller's chapter talks about the importance of what he terms robust dialogue between high level civilians and high level military officials in terms of getting into the war plans what the civilians want and expect. Then Mike Elliott's chapter is a pretty technical chapter and fascinating chapter um, on how we actually translate the guidance into war plans. What actually happens? How do you do it? What's considered? How do you pick a target? Um, and what that process looks like. Um, and he focuses in that chapter on planning since the end of the Cold War, which among other reasons, but very importantly for technology is quite different um, than in earlier decades, including various types of flexibility 
um, that are now available in, in terms of changing targeting. And then Lyndon Brooks um, in the last chapter looks at the intersection between arms control and nuclear operations and tries to explain the importance of nuclear operations for agreements and makes the case in there that the agreements we get are limited or constrained in an appropriate way by the operational requirements of the forces as well as just the numbers. So that's a real thumbnail sketch. Um, that's pretty much what the book does. I would just say for the audience, so much, and it's consistent with the remarks that Brian and Austin just made, so much of the discussion of nuclear forces is simply the forces. Like, what are we going to get and how many are there? Um, but for particularly for people who are knowledgeable in the business, um, so much of the danger, so much of the deterrent value, and in sense, so much of the challenge is actually in what we call operations, which is sort of everything else. It's not just buying and procuring the forces, but the targeting, the translation of guidance into targeting, um, planning for putting forces on alert, um, and practicing that, um, and managing the, the force, the people, the personnel that make all that happen. Um, and so the book, I think the book does give a very good feel for those other dimensions, um, and it's hopefully among its contributions. So with that, we're going to change chairs. <laughs> I'm staying here. I'm staying in my way. Do you want to sit on the end here? I'll stand back. Do you want to see the word of the trap? Great. Okay, I will do my brief introductions and then we'll move right to the speakers. And hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions. I'm going to start with General Robert Taylor, who retired from the Air Force in 2014. He was the commander of the U.S. Strategic Command, which I think most of you or all of you know is responsible for the plans and operations of all U.S. forces conducting strategic deterrence. So that's beyond the nuclear forces, but the new, all the nuclear forces. Don Harvey is a physicist with extensive experience working on nuclear weapons issues, including at Lawrence Livermore, Stanford, and senior positions at the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy. And Elaine Bunn served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear um, and Missile Defense Policy, as well as other positions in DOD um, and at NDU at the National Defense University. Um, there are much more, um, or there's a partial, a somewhat more extensive um, bios just in the, the um, in the advertisement for the event, so they all deserve much more extensive introductions. But for the sake of time, we'll start with General Kiro. And Charlie, thanks very much. I'm on the upside of a cold and laryngitis that I inherited uh, fairly from a two year old grandson. <laughs> Every time he comes home from daycare, he seems to be carrying some new germs of some kind or other. And so, <laughs> exactly, my <laughs> old as a two year old coming home from daycare. So uh, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here today. Uh, I, I know that um, describing the book and in some small measure, my contribution to it is, is a very important uh, uh, follow-up for the things you heard about Jan Nolan. And uh, when Jan contacted me, uh, she said, uh, gee, I'm thinking about uh, having a book written, uh, not writing a book, but having a book written. <laughs> And right away, I, I, my no comes to mind. <laughs> and these guys describe this pretty well. Uh, I'm not an author. This is a painful process for me to put pen to paper, unless it's writing, go do this. That's easier to do for somebody who were four stars. So uh, the, this, though, became a labor of love. She uh, originally uh, asked me, then she cajoled me, then she threatened me, <laughs> and finally uh, I accepted, and I'm glad I did, because uh, this has been a, a labor of love. I know it was a labor of love for her, picked up by the editors and, and by Charlie, and, and I think by all the rest of us. My chapter is entitled Commanding Nuclear Forces, and that's what I was privileged to do. Uh, my first time having the word commander associated with my name, I was a first lieutenant, crew commander of a Minuteman crew in Montana. You would think the word commander associated with a first lieutenant and uh, Minuteman missiles sounds like 
a really big, important job, and I would like to say it is, but uh, my command uh, included me and one other person. However, uh, that sort of began something uh, with me. Uh, I found that that mission uh, in, in still the height of the Cold War was incredibly, incredibly important. And I began to experience firsthand those pressures that are on the human beings that that uh, are at the tip of the nuclear spear for us. Uh, and that's what I wanted to bring to this conversation in my chapter. And I, I hope I did that because I went on to command in a squadron of Minutemen, uh, 50 uh, Minutemen 2s at the time, just being retired at the end of the Cold War. Then I commanded a group of 200 Minutemen 3s, again, back in Montana at that time, the largest of the ICBM units uh, in the US Air Force. Then I commanded at the wing, the major command and combatant command levels. And so I have uh, a bit of experience in these issues from that perspective. Uh, I'm not a policy maker, but I contributed to policy making. And that's something that um, is an important feature of this book, I think, is that relationship between military and civilian leaders who are charged with developing policy and then implementing the measures to carry it out. So I'm going to bring you a first-hand perspective. There are unique leadership challenges associated with nuclear weapon, um, particularly since the objective here is nuclear deterrence, not nuclear war. Uh, I don't think you would ever find someone wearing a uniform who likes nuclear weapons. I think you'll find a lot of people wearing uniforms who understand what nuclear weapons bring to our national security and the foundational role that they play in our national security. Uh, the most recently retired commander of US Strategic Command, Admiral Chaz Richard, uh, said not so long ago, and I agree with this, which is why I'm quoting him, and he said it publicly, which is why I can. Uh, he said, everything else depends on nuclear deterrence. Everything else depends upon nuclear deterrence. We don't have nuclear deterrence, nothing else works in our national security arrangement. I think that's right. So um, waging deterrence, I believe, is an apt description of the primary purpose and focus of our nuclear commanders and the people that they lead. So I'm going to use a few selected quotes from my chapter to highlight just a couple of things that um, this would be called, maybe if I was doing a commercial a teaser. <laughs> so this is going to make you want to rush out and get over this book. I'm sure. And if not, uh, here's a little bit about it. First, this is a quote, to sustain a credible and effective nuclear deterrent, the warriors at the tip of the nuclear sphere must have unequivocal and unambiguous clarity, commitment, and support from the chain of command that demands their efforts. This is an ageless leadership principle that we ignore again at great peril to the nation. The transition in the nuclear forces from Cold War to post-Cold War happened over three decades. And during those three decades, the clarity that we had in the Cold War about purpose and mission and threat and urgency began to diminish. And while policymakers continued to say that nuclear deterrence was foundational to our national security, they didn't back that up with the actions that they took. In some cases, nuclear forces were put on a starvation diet. And when 9-11 occurred, for good reasons, the nation's security priorities changed. The problem was that after a while, the people who do this mission looked around and said, this must not be as important as everyone is telling us because we can't get things fixed. And no one is paying attention to us we don't need much, but somebody has to pay attention. And over time, the focus began to drift. And we had some very unfortunate incidents that occurred that I think got policymakers and senior commanders' attention, fortunately. And a number of improvements and changes were made. And I think that those were all very, very critical moves that the nation took. And I would Commend to us that we had best be very careful about the people who sit at the tip of this spear. 
The second quote that I want to give you is related to this. Although policy, excuse me, although policy plans and hardware typically dominate the conversation, the men and women who operate our nuclear forces and maintain, secure, and support the nuclear mission form the most important component of the U.S. nuclear deterrent. Absent their dedication and professional performance, policies and plans are empty words and weapon systems not a credible threat. I wanted my chapter to focus on the human dimension of this because it's the people that form the deterrent. You can put new hardware out there, but it doesn't mean anything unless that hardware is staffed and operated by people who are highly trained, well led motivated and who understand what their responsibilities are, understand why theirs is the highest standards among a military that has high standards everywhere. Theirs are the highest. Why? Because errors here are immediately international issues. And rightfully so. This is one of those this is one of those jobs where um, I used to say perfection is the standard, and somebody said to me, <clears throat> careful with that, but I'll stand by that. Perfection is the standard, and it has to be. Perfection has to be the standard. And that's not to say that you don't have perfection in other aspects of our military. If you do, you know, if you're dropping an iron bomb, you better have the coordinates right. There's perfection required there. But in this case, the standards that they are called to uphold, the psychological pressures that they have to face the thanklessness that they have. There's not much glamour associated with the nuclear deterrent force. I can tell you that sitting in a missile launch control center tonight, where it's colder down there than it is outside, probably, um, and you are wondering if anybody else in the world is awake, uh, that is a thankless job. There is no glamour associated. And it is a mission that is never ending. It never ends. You don't get any kind of satisfaction out of completing the mission. The mission is deterrence. Now that requires combat readiness. And that requires combat readiness every day. And that extends as far into the future as you can see. It started in the late 1940s. That is not to say that our conventional forces don't do something important. They do. Everybody contributes to deterrence. But that commitment in the nuclear forces is something that drives them and it drives their commanders and it drives the standards and the other unique ethical and legal challenges that they have because deterrence credibility depends on human factors. Third quote I want to mention is STRATCOM commander serves as the military advisor and expert to the Secretary of Defense and the President. The commander also provides military advice and expertise to the Joint Chiefs, its chair, and to Congress. 21st century is not a repeat of the Cold War. I always cringe when somebody describes today's environment as the new Cold War. That is a bad way to look at what is happening in the world. Because the Cold War was the Cold War, not to be repeated. Different people, different players, different environment, different global security arrangements, different interconnections. Everything is different today. It was during the Cold War. Everything. And so we need to be very careful about basing all of our deterrence theory today on lessons we learned in the Cold War. Some of it applies. I think there are foundational pieces of deterrence that don't change. But adversaries today are different, and they are all different. There is no one size fits all when we are talking about deterrence. Um, I was personally involved in the planning process from policy development to target selection. There were four areas that really got my time and attention. The first was political military interaction. That is the job of the STRATCOM commander, is to be that face of the nuclear operation. You know, the only place where, where nuclear deterrence comes together is in the combatant commands. That sort of forces, people, plans, policies, and everything come together to form the operational part of our deterrent. And so my job was to make sure that the policymakers and the military people understood one another. We didn't always agree, but we understood one another. 
and we moved our collective efforts forward to achieve the policies that the nation has laid out for nuclear deterrence. The second one that got my attention was planning assumptions. Uh, as I say in my chapter, except for the use of two crude weapons 75 plus years ago, no one has ever experienced a nuclear war. There's a lot of theory here. We make a lot of assumptions about nuclear war, what it would be like, how we would do it, what would happen, what would escalate, what wouldn't escalate, and the, the stakes are enormous. It contributes to deterrence, in my view. The fact that this is an abyss with unknowns, I believe, is, is hugely important for leaders around the world when they are considering whether or not you're able to take that step. Uh, legal constraints is another very interesting issue. Uh, I think uh, it is clear for many decades, US policy has directed the planners to comply with the laws of armed conflict. Uh, I was never in a meeting where we talked about targeting or planning or exercises where we did execution. There was not a lawyer with me, not making decisions, but telling me whether or not we were on firm legal ground. That's important. And I think that's a factor that, that contributes to the, the credibility of our deterrent. And then finally, plan integration. Um, doesn't make nuclear war more likely if you include nuclear weapons in plan. It makes it less likely. And so people say, well, you're practicing nuclear war. Yep, you better, you better because the credibility of the deterrent depends on it. And finally, the last thing that I want to mention is release, to release nuclear weapons, crews must have an explicit order from the President of the United States. While all U.S. military forces operate under strict civilian control, Commander-in-Chief retains sole authority to order the combat employment of U.S. nuclear weapons. That authority is not delegated down the chain of command. So I spend quite a bit of time in the later part of my chapter talking about the nuclear command control system nuclear command and control, and the nuclear decision process. That has become a public issue periodically. Uh, certainly, several years ago, it was a public enough issue that uh, our prominent political leaders, to include the Speaker of the House, uh, questioned whether or not the President should have that sole authority. It's an interesting conversation to have. Uh, and uh, I give you my perspective on it in the chapter. So with that, uh, there's a lot more of the chapter than, than uh, that I can mention right here, uh, aside from reading it to you. And the last time I read something to somebody, I got a cold. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. And, and uh, I do appreciate being here. And thanks, Charlie, for your role in, in all of this. And I look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Great. Thank you. John. One of the last times I was in this, uh, can you hear me? The last times I was in this room was for Dan Mullins Memorial. Members, I think Charlie, you had some wonderful remarks. On behalf of my co author, John Warden, raise your hand, John, so people know who you are. Um, I'm pleased to spend a few minutes talking, walking you through chapter seven of the book addressing US nuclear command and control system, what that system is designed to do, and issues regarding its modernization. By the way, I started out in this business in the late 1970s. My first assignment as a young PhD at Lawrence Livermore was to calculate the vulnerability of satellites, which are critical pieces of the NC2 system, the vulnerability to radiation environments produced by high altitude nuclear detonations. Such detonations augment trapped electrons in the naturally occurring Van Allen radiation belts. My job was to calculate the dose to those satellites flying through those belts so that any degradation in system performance or system life could be assessed. Not to be too cute, it was a blast. <laughs> One of the guys I used to hang out with then began his career in national security with a similar focus on the NC2 system and its survivability to Cold War threats. Although proceeding on different paths, he as I retained a career long interest in the health and vigor of what is often an unappreciated element of nuclear deterrence. Unappreciated to say the least, some of us back then characterized NC2 as the bastard stepchild of nuclear forces. That guy, 
Ash Carter, may he rest in peace. During his Pentagon career as Assistant Secretary for Policy, Under Secretary for Acquisition, Deputy Secretary, and then Secretary of Defense, drove a change in culture that led to increased very senior level attention to the sustainment and modernization of the nuclear command and control system and capabilities. It is fair to say that greatly expanded efforts over the, a decade and more to advance the NDC, NC2 system of the future will remain a part of his extensive legacy. Why nuclear command and control? Critical nuclear deterrence is the command and control system that links US forces, ICBMs, SLBMs, nuclear capable heavy bombers, and nuclear capable fighter aircraft with presidential authority. It must operate even in the midst of a major nuclear crisis with potentially accelerated decision timelines. Absent effective command and control, these forces are useless because they cannot be executed. Reliable, effective NC2 is a must, irrespective of the size and composition of US nuclear forces. What is the NC2 system? Today's NC2 system is a legacy of the Cold War. It is fundamentally the same system that we had in place in the 1970s and described by Ash Carter almost 40 years ago in his seminal article in Scientific America. There has been upgrading and modernization of components, but the fundamental systems architecture remains as it was back then, characterized by information technologies and electronics that range from modern day to 1960s vintage. Portions of the system are dedicated to the nuclear mission. Other, other portions are multiple use and employed during general purpose military operations. An extensive program deemed next gen NC2 is now underway to field a modern system that will be responsive to anticipated future threats. Basic elements of today's NC2 architecture include launch detection satellites and radars, ground-based radars for early warning attack. Two, facilities to interpret early warning information. Airborne ground, mobile, and fixed command centers. A command center is the central node, is a central node for receiving and authenticating presidential decisions and communicating them to forces. And satellite, air to ground, air to air, air to undersea, as well as landline communications. Fielding and modernizing nuclear command and control systems on a, rely on a discipline well-grounded in certain key principles. To avoid mischaracterization of an attack, two distinct physical means for launch detection, both satellite infrared sensors and radar, ground mesh radar sensors uh, are used in attack assessment. Nuclear command and control systems are hardened to robust nuclear environments, including multiple survivable communications links between command centers and forces. As Bob said, only the president can authorize use of nuclear weapons. Never are they to be used in any other circumstance. This combination of technologies and procedures that provide so-called positive and negative control of nuclear weapons has important implications addressed in detail in chapter seven. What is the NC system supposed to do? It has five functions. Provide clear, unambiguous, and timely detection and characterization of attack. Two, establish a conference among the president and senior advisors to convey critical information needed to assess the attack and determine a timely response. Three, communicate an authenticated presidential decision in the form of an emergency action message, we call them EAMs, to nuclear forces. Four, provide enduring control of surviving forces. And fifth, in order to support force execution, uh, we the system must provide pre-planned strike options and capabilities for rapid, real-time, adaptive planning to address contingencies as they may arise. In a nuclear crisis, Depending on the time urgency of a response, the president will seek a broad set of information on global developments and the status of US and adversary forces. Let me give you a few examples, global political developments, 
corroborating information from allies and partners, status of an adversary's nuclear forces, including its alert posture, status of U.S. nuclear forces, attack assessment derived from early warning and reports on damage assessment. In the midst of a conventional conflict, for example, the president would want to know any indications of impending nuclear employment by the adversary. After an adversary's limited first nuclear use, for example, a president would likely seek rapid post-attack assessment before deciding to respond. This information would be provided from intelligence, from open sources, from the internet, from combatant commands, and from US allies. If a decision is made to respond with nuclear weapons, if a decision is made, the president would convey that decision down depending on circumstances to the defense secretary, the STRATCOM commander, strategic command commander, am I right? Colonel on duty in the National Military Command Center in the Pentagon, or flag officer flying airborne alert on um, air, airborne command control aircraft. Once authenticated, it is communicated by these nodes to the force components for execution. A modernization priority is to develop and field an architecture for, the, for an NC2 system to address 21st century conflict. Everything is changing, as Bob has said, and I'm going to point out a few of the changes. Several emerging foreign developments challenge this program. One, a seeming and troubling trend of increasing Russian salience in nuclear, in, uh, increasing salience in Russian nuclear doctrine for limited first use of nuclear weapons during a conventional regional conflict. We've heard a lot about that lately. Increasing foreign capabilities for attacks on US launch detection and communication satellites, and not just from Russia and China. Increasing foreign capabilities for global precision conventional strike. Capabilities that could threaten key nodes, including radars, ground stations, and fixed command centers. Potential future vulnerability command and control aircraft while aloft. Intercontinental cruise missiles and hypersonic boost glide vehicles that are far more difficult to track and that pose a zero warning attack threat to the president. Pursuit of sophisticated offensive cyber warfare capabilities that could threaten secure communications and be used to disrupt other elements of the NC2 system. Efforts to advance the next generation, next gen NC2 systems architecture responsive to these threats are underway. A few are elaborated below, starting with cyber. The cyber threat to NC2 was not even an afterthought in the 1970s origin system. Today, some of us lose sleep worrying about this threat. Cyber penetration of NC2 raises two concerns, the ability of hackers to prevent an authorized nuclear response to an actual strike, or two, instigate an inadvertent launch of forces absent of real threat. On the former, an adversary could cause early warning systems to miss or mischaracterize an attack, disrupt the links that support presidential conferencing, alter or block a force execution message, disrupt missile launch control systems, causing a delivery platform to malfunction, or cause nuclear warheads to dud and drive. On the latter, an enemy hack could cause early warning systems to report a launch where none occurs, bypass launch control safeguards, or alter or block a war termination EAM. While such attacks are not implausible, existing NC2 provides means to mitigate this risk. Next-gen NC2 must devote renewed attention to this risk as foreign cyber capabilities evolve. Senior leader communications is another issue. A president may wish to securely consult with a broader set of advisors, as well as foreign leaders from allied partner and potentially adversary countries. This is in the context of a complex modern conflict scenarios characterized by conventional operations with allies and partners, combined offense and defense, and response to possible nuclear use. 
communications could take place with the president at the White House, on the move, at a trip location, or at an undisclosed site. The demand for high quality voice, video, and data transmissions in these contingencies and in potentially stressed environments greatly exceed the capabilities developed for the Cold War. Modern early warning. Early warning will become increasingly challenging if Russia and China deploy, as I referred to earlier, intercontinental cruise missiles and hypersonic boost computers. A collection of warning satellites and radars optimized to detect and track ballistic missiles will struggle with maneuverable hypersonic systems and low-flying cruise missiles. Such systems potentially pose a zero-warning decapitation threat to national command authorities. At a minimum, there would be increased uncertainty about adversary intent when and if each such launches were detected. U.S. modernization of early warning systems must account for a full complement of adversary means for strategic strike. Increased presidential decision time, and I have to give John and his work at IDA a shout out here because they, they produced a report for the Congress, which was extraordinary. No president, I suspect, has ever fancied the choice to either launch ICBMs quickly before enemy warheads arrive on missile fields or wait and lose them. President Obama's nuclear employment policy issued in 2013 called attention with the Cold War's end to a significantly diminished probability of a disarming surprise nuclear attack. It directed a look at options to reduce, but not eliminate, the role of ICBM launch under attack in US planning, and thereby increase the time to make critical decisions bearing on national supply. Ensuring the ability to detect short or zero warning threats, such as those discussed above, would facilitate evacuation of the president from Washington and reduce pressures on an early decision to respond. Chapter seven details several other means of increasing decision time. Satellite communications. Today's satellite communications architecture is based on a very few expensive, multi-purpose, higher earth orbit satellites that are vulnerable to direct attack or disruption of their data links by jamming or other means. These satellites are becoming more and more dual purpose assets, providing command and control for conventional as well as nuclear operations. A debate is underway, maybe well underway, may even be decided, I'm not sure, about whether to continue with this approach or to evolve to a proliferated, low earth orbit constellation of many small, single purpose, cheap satellites. Such a constellation would be designed to for rapid replenishment to restore lost functionality should a portion of the system come, come under attack. Given the emerging vulnerability of satellite systems, other options must also be examined. Some hard choices on the way ahead for global NC2 communications must occur before a next-gen system architecture can be finalized. Survivability of nuclear command control aircraft. Once aloft and outside integrated air defense zones, NC2 aircraft were generally thought to be survivable for an extended period. We need to rethink this, particularly as we move to replace aging aircraft. Specifically, Air Force One, the NAOC and E6B Takamo, which are command and control aircraft, may become more vulnerable to detection and targeting than in the past. Advanced sensors with faster processing will improve the ability of adversaries to exploit electronic communications and other unique electronic signatures to locate, track, and target mobile platforms. Chapter seven raises other thorny NC modernization challenges, as well as some ideas John and I offer for addressing them. And I refer to the chapter because there's a lot of nice pictures in there that take the place of the words that I've been speaking to you. But success in this effort, this modernization effort, conveys an important message for nuclear deterrence. That is, US forces cannot and will not be neutralized by attacks on the NC2 system. And with that, I conclude. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, my chapter in this book is about extending nuclear deterrence and assurance to our allies. Um, it looks at the post-Cold War era, as Charlie pointed out, the whole book does. Um, but really, in this case, it looks at uh, 
1991 to 2021, I will say, because any of you who've been through the publication process understand that uh, it's a little time consuming and there's a cutoff date and so forth. So, uh, and add to that, that those of us who are former practitioners in the US government had to go through clearance process. So um, really my chapter was completed before some things that I would later probably have included, like uh, the February 24th, Russia second invasion of, of Ukraine and NATO's June 2022 strategic concept. And before China's nuclear buildup was as clear as it is now, and before, for instance, the South Korean president um, Yoon uh, made his nuclear comments last month. So this just points out how dynamic this whole issue of extended deterrence insurance is. There is no one and done in this. It, it's a constant. Um, this, my chapter is in two parts. First is just the facts. Um, kind of baseline of current as a publication, the, the Alliance Nuclear uh, Strategy and Policy, the forces, the consultative mechanisms, the operational practices, um, which today differ a lot from earlier Cold War period. And, and not everyone seems to understand that. Um, and that I'm looking at, at alliances in um, Europe as well as in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and then I think that part was to provide a foundation, not just for longtime practitioners, but also people who are newer to, to, the, to the subject. Um, the second part is my observations as a 40 year practitioner of, of extended deterrence and assurance. Uh, I started my career um, and with the 1979 NATO decision on the dual track decision, deployment of INF um, version two ground launch cruise missiles, uh, along with arms control negotiations with the then Soviets uh, based on their deployment of SS-20 missiles. So, I mean, this was, this was a big deal in the um, extended nuclear deterrence assurance uh, arena. Um, I ended my career uh, as DASD 2013 to 17, um, co-chairing deterrence dialogues with Japan, South Korea, and NATO, again, this became an issue again after certainly after the 2014 uh, Russian annexation, illegal annexation of, of Crimea. So, but all of these, all of these issues were really ripe um, and and kind of controversial, uh, being relooked uh, during that time period. Um, I'm just gonna for a second be sure that we're all on the same wavelength on, on terminology. Uh, the, the chapter focuses on extended nuclear deterrence. Now for allies, deterrence has multiple parts. There's what they do for themselves, their own capabilities and words and actions. There's what we do together. Um, many want to do examples if, you, if you'd like. Um, and then there's what the US does for them. And so far that has been for everyone except uh, the UK and France, it's been the nuclear deterrence part. So that's actually where, where this chapter focuses. Other term, allies is a term that is often used very loosely. You can find all kinds of documents that everybody's an ally. Um, I am using it um, to refer to allies to whom we have explicitly extended nuclear deterrence commitments. I'll name them, the NATO countries, Japan, South Korea, and Australia. That's my view of who is has extended nuclear deterrence commitments now. Now, yes, there are some, there, there are lots of questions we can get into um, in the discussion, but uh, while each of those alliances has a treaty foundation, and that's, those are in the appendix of the book because I always, through 40 years of working on these issues, I always wanted to go, wait a minute, what does the treaty really say? So there's, there are treaties that underlie all these, these uh, commitments, but really it's subsequent practice that really affects all this. Um, all the decades of government to government meetings, all the consultations from, from the presidential level down to working level. And we're talking military, civilian, political leaders. It's that day-to-day -day interaction that's really the instantiation of, of extended, extended nuclear deterrence. Um, yeah, extended deterrence is more than just nuclear. And the... Um, the overall state of alliance is affected by a lot more than just, just nuclear. Um, conventional capabilities, 
uh, forward deployed and forward deployable forces, uh, conventional forces, and in the case of NATO, forward deployed nuclear forces and forward deployable ones uh, in, a, in, in Asia Pacific. Um, but um, but this, this extended nuclear deterrence commitment to these 30 plus countries means that the US has both publicly and privately affirmed that aggression against those countries could, under some circumstances, when the president decides, uh, merit a US nuclear response. So that's, that's really what we're talking about. Um, in theory, um, assurance and extended deterrence should be pretty much the same, right? You are, to assure allies, you should, theoretically, it should be fine if you uh, believe uh, you can deter allies, adversaries, and be able to respond to aggression against them. In practice, sometimes it takes even more to assure than it does to, to deter. Uh, and that's why I think deter, assure, and respond are all separate goals of our nuclear policy. Um, many of you probably know about the Healy theorem. There was a, a British defense minister, Dennis Healy, in the 1960s who uh, said, uh, one only needed 5% credibility to deter the Russians, but 95% to reassure the Europeans. Um, I don't take that literally. I mean, I'm not going to assign numbers to it, but I think there's something to uh, Healy's point. And it's really not surprising, I think, that, um, that it's, it's hard to assure, given the amazing nature of, of extended nuclear deterrence. It, it, I read this, maybe I, I understood it in graduate school, size, sorry, not GW, but size, but, um, but I, maybe I understood it when I was reading all this stuff in graduate school, but it really didn't sink in for about, oh, 30 years probably. How amazing this is, both from both perspectives, from the extendee and the extender, from the extendee, the ally, who is a sovereign country that has given up a little bit of its own latitude uh, in high-end situations including deterring and responding to nuclear use against its people and territory. And they're relying on another nation for that. That's amazing. Um, and it's amazing that the US, the extender, takes on the, the risk and the responsibility of uh, putting its own forces and even its own population territory at risk for an ally. Um, it is amazing to the point that not everyone has believed it. Um, you can read uh, Pierre Gaulois and André Beaufre and Charles de Gaulle, and you will find that they thought it was incredible. It was too amazing to believe, and that's why you have an independent French nuclear force now. Um, it, it, it's, when you think about it that way, it really should be no surprise that allies need constant reassurance or that the question of whether the U.S. would really put itself at risk to come to on allies' defense has been the subtext of much of the discussion with allies over many, many decades. Um, why does it matter if they're assured? Well, one is because actually we do care about our allies. Allies are in our interest. Um, it's one of the distinguishing factors of American foreign and national security policy, you know, having other democratic nations that generally align with, with, our, um, with our values and interests. Um, it, it's, uh, it's not a favor that we do for allies, uh, this is my point. And the other is because we really don't want them to feel that they need to have their own uh, nuclear weapons. I would say, and others have said this, that extended nuclear deterrence is one of the most effective non-proliferation tools that we have. And I think we're gonna be looking at that again. Um, understanding uh, nuclear operations in U.S. alliances is about a whole lot more than just the weapons or uh, what you think of as military operational details. It's not just about, some of you may be familiar with the NATO exercise uh, that Steadfast Noon that's done annually and allies, some allies who have dual capable aircraft uh, practice uh, what it would be like to upload, not real, but fake weapons onto those aircraft. And, and so all that, you go through all those exercises. Is that what managing nuclear operations and extended nuclear deterrence is about? If, if you limit your view to that, I think you're missing 
uh, some of the key uh, pieces. Um, I, again, it gets to, I think it's, um, the forces are indeed, our, our nuclear forces, US nuclear forces, the, um, the, the nuclear arrangements that we have in NATO, all of that is absolutely, that, that's important, but it is really, I think, the consultations, the dialogues, the visits, the exercises, the, that is what extended nuclear deterrence is really about, I think. Um, the stuff matters. I won't say it doesn't matter, but it's the overall relationship that matters more. Um, and again, that's at all levels, working all the way up to, to heads of government, um, military, civilian, political, it's all of that. Um, of course, it may be changing a bit, how allies see this, it's always gonna change based on um, threats as they change. And we've certainly seen some changes um, in recent, recent uh, months and years. Uh, allies' threat perceptions, which may not be the same as ours. Um, domestic politics, both theirs and ours. Um, Growing awareness of nuclear issues among experts, of both governments and publics in, um, in Japan, Korea, as well as NATO, partly because of <laughs> dangerous neighborhoods and what's going on in the world. Um, and I do think that there's more worry about whether the US would respond on their behalf than about US capability to respond. Um, we will debate. And everybody loves to debate the forces. And should we have this? Should we have that? Should we just like mention it or not? Um, the worries, I think, are more about, about um, do we have the backs than it is about do we have the stuff. Um, as I say, it's it's not it's never one and done. It is really a constant. Uh, we've had consultations with NATO uh, on nuclear deterrence since the 60s, the 1960s. But with Japan and Korea, uh, only since 2010. Um, and with Australia, even more recently, part, not because we didn't offer, just because I think their threat perceptions were not at a place where they thought it was necessary. Um, so th in the second um, section, I talk about some of my, my own observations of four years trying to do this. And I guess the, the, the ones I'll highlight for you are, um, uh, don't, the biggest one I took away was don't surprise your allies. And that goes in both directions. There have been many times in our history where, um, you know, mm, let's say we'll cancel an exercise and say it's because it's too expensive. Uh, or we'll do something and they didn't know we were going to cancel it. I didn't, I, I, I won't even, okay. Um, <laughs> there have been times when allies surprised us. Uh, after the South nuclear, North Korean nuclear test in 2016, when the South Koreans rolled out to their, their um, parliament and publics, uh, their Korea mass punishment retaliation um, strategy, that really there had not been a good consultation on. That was a surprise in the other direction. So we shouldn't surprise allies. We can disagree, we can debate, we can discuss, eventually come to some kind of common denominator or something but don't surprise your allies. I guess that's my one big takeaway for any of you who are go out, we'll go out there and be, be practitioners. The other one that is, I think, hard for Americans is listen as well as talk. <laughs> we're really good about flying in, briefing allies, this is what we're gonna do, calling them the day before we're gonna announce something publicly. I call that, that's surprising your allies still. You need to, you need to listen to them uh, they have. They know what their threat perceptions are. They may have even have some insights about how you deter uh, their and your common adversary. Um, and so you really do need to listen as well as talk. So with that, there's some others in there, but you can read the book for that. <laughs> um, with that, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank all of our speakers for keeping in their time limits, which means there's plenty of time for questions. So we'll take questions, but I just add that I think I said this when I was making the introduction, but one thing you see from this panel and you see it throughout the book is just like the depth of expertise and experience that comes through in the kind of nuance that is you don't get from newcomers. And um, I think that all these remarks, each impressive in their own ways, had that element. So 
Um, I'll start over here. Yeah. And if you could introduce yourself. Thank you. We're going to have a microphone that will come around. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I wrote to semi retired. Uh, we talked a lot about how we manage our nuclear um, operations. Do we know how well Russia and China manages their operations? And um, um, is, there, is there ground for concern? Um, I'm going to let the, also Brian and Austin, to the extent they want to speak about this and can to answer these. And if people don't want to answer questions, then we can let them go because maybe none of us are experts on that. Um, but if anybody wants to speak up on it, I'm not going to. If you want to say anything about this or not. So I can give you an impression that I had based upon uh, my time in uniform. And I can't speak as much today, uh, obviously. But I, I believe that over time, with our engagement with the Soviets, particularly through the arms control process and through other engagements, I think we learned a lot about them and how they commanded and controlled and, and how the, the safeguards that, that they had, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know that we were always satisfied about that. And certainly at the end of the Cold War, the United States under the Nun Luger. Uh, initiative stepped in to help them secure things that you were very concerned about. So I, I'm not going to say blanket that that the, that we thought that everything was fine with them, but I think at least my impression, my personal impression, always was I didn't lose any sleep over over the Soviet or the Russian command and control over their nuclear weapons. I believe that they had good command and control over their nuclear weapons. I, I can't speak for whether that's still the view. And I can tell you this, I wish that I had known a lot more about what the Chinese were doing. So I would just leave it at that. I, I think that over time, um, as the Chinese were more interested in growing their nuclear forces, uh, I'm not sure that our understanding of how they command and control kept up with all of that. So I'll just say this. Yeah, that's my uh, it's been reported um, that the Russians do something that we would we have never considered. Uh, that is, in the time of an extreme crisis, um, the reports are that the Russians have, have a system that will allow their execution of nuclear forces to be automatic. For example, in a, in a, in a certain heavy uh, uh, nuclear crisis, possibly involving a conventional war, ongoing conventional war, uh, possibly involving heightened alert status of both the, both U.S. and Russian nuclear forces. If, if 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 warheads were landing on Russian territory and no execution message had been received, there was a possibility that it could be uh, the, that nuclear weapons could be launched automatically, and that would could be turned on and turned off. And the Russians have said they turned it off back in the uh, post Cold War period. But there's some ambiguity uh, and some statements that they may have turned it back on again. Uh, I have no idea. And how, we, we would not do that. And if it's hard to know what, how China commands and controls and, and secures uh, North Korea even harder. Yeah, and I think that ultimately um, in every one of these cases, you have to have great insight, I think, into the leadership that's involved. Who would be making the decision? What risks are they willing to take? Uh, this is a real challenge for our intelligence community. And I think far more, um, uh, far deeper challenge than it was during the Cold War, where we were basically looking at an entity uh, trying to deter that singular Soviet threat. And today it's a lot different. And I think for us to believe that the Chinese would think like the Russians, like the North Koreans, like Somebody else, I think that's bad thinking. So we've got to learn a lot about them. And I think this is also a reason for why, uh, certainly I always believe that, that that there's value in connections. There's value in having a conversation with them. I thought there was value in military military connections. That's pretty hard right now with the Russians, but, but uh, I think that there's value. So 
Sir Alexander Wright, uh, graduate student here at George Washington. Uh, my question for you is uh, about dual use technology in the uh, nuclear field. Uh, so you, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Henry, about the, uh, about the satellites. Harvey. Harvey, I apologize, my words. Uh, about the, the satellites that could be uh, used for uh, dual uses. And I think that there, uh, there was a recent paper that talked about uh, targeting Chinese uh, uh, assets could feel as though we're degrading their nuclear response capability and that, that could provoke an unintended nuclear response because of the dual use. Uh, I think one of the things that you mentioned was uh, single use satellites. Uh, does that create certainty or is or by having uncertainty, does that help uh, deterrence? I think one of the points um, that has been made, including by James Acton and Brookings, is that uh, the the, uh, the combination combining um, tactical comms you know, with nuclear comms on a single you know, on a single uh, platform uh, has some risks, and the risks are that in a conventional war, with the ability with the increased ability to attack satellites. A particular legitimate target in convention war is tactical command and control. And an attack on a US satellite focused on that mission will also affect the nuclear mission. And there is the risk that um, the United States will view an attack on a satellite with nuclear, nuclear command and control capability be extraordinarily. Uh, uh, threatening aggressive. So there's a, a, a logic for trying to separate nuclear uh, from active communications. Bob, do you have anything more you want to say? Yeah, this is one of those problems that I just think gets harder. I, I don't know that you can ever slap the table and say, all right, we're going to have one system up here that does nuclear command control and there's everything else up here. That's not the way we've ever done it. Uh, in, the, in the current nuclear command control system, there are leased line, commercial lines. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff connected here in ways that, that um, may not be obvious uh, on the surface, even to the people who are deeply involved. Uh, I think that there are some things that are obvious, and we probably ought to say are obvious, but the cyber threat people that I've talked to have said the worst thing you can do is have an isolated system that is a single purpose system that people can identify and go after. The best thing you can do is proliferate everywhere. So I, I just think that this one is going to be really hard. I, I don't I don't know that you can completely isolate a nuclear command control system. I think that you can have some things that are obvious, even our sensors, the radar sensors, uh, their their primary purpose is missile warning. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they're doing space surveillance. So, I, you know, I just think this one's hard. I, I think, though, this gets back to a question about are there such things as red lines? Um, I think you have to be careful with that, that whole notion that something is a red line. If you do this, then that happens. Or if you do this, then that happens. I think we've just got to be clear that, that there is risk from an adversary. That, that an adversary is taking risk if they are deciding to do the following things. And I think that plays into our nuclear policy, which says we, we do not have a sole use policy. We do not have a no first use policy. And so the reason for that is, Mr. Enemy, you are taking all the risk here. You are taking the risk. So you can speculate whether or not that would cause us to react in a certain way, but, but I think you're taking the risk. Hi, my name is Molly Grace. Um, this is more directed to um, Ms. Bunn. Um, um, I'm really interested in gender deterrence. Um, good. Um, and so I was wondering, what do you think about, what, I'm wondering if you could speak more on President Zinn's feelings um, inflammatory behavior. Um, yeah, I, I think you're referring to, let me say, last month into this month about uh, maybe um, the U.S. needed to either bring back uh, nuclear weapons to the peninsula 
or maybe South Korea might need to get its own nuclear weapons. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. I'm, I'm paraphrasing from press reports. Um, so the, the, the whole idea that um, South Korea has been concerned for a good long while, uh, given multiple North Korean nuclear tests and uh, missile tests, uh, those this year, um, everybody's kind of waiting for the seventh nuclear test. Uh, and those all make the, the public uh, aware again of, of what a dangerous neighborhood it is. And so there have been public polls in South Korea for some time that basically say that, that uh, the, the ones that consistently over almost a decade will say things like, um, gee, maybe we should have nuclear weapons deployed here or we should get our own nuclear weapons. Um, Public opinion polls are not, that's not how we run our foreign policy. So I don't, I don't think that's, that's um, definitive. <laughs> um, and so how governments decide to, uh, what's necessary for their own national security is really what you have to listen to. Um, sometimes allies do file balloons. Sometimes they say, so this is one of those places where continuing at all those levels, discussions about what do they really feel they need? I do recall after, I mean, we were talking 2016 when there were a couple of nuclear tests uh, where they wanted more strategic assets in the region. And, it, you know, after some discussion, it became clear that that could mean anything from a carrier that does a port visit to, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean um, all the way to we deploy, redeploy nuclear weapons on PEN or they get their own. So I think there are a whole range of things that can be done to, um, to reassure um, ROC and both the government and, and the publics. And that one's kind of for, for that end. Uh, we ought to take seriously though, when they say things like this, we ought to have serious conversations about it and not just do a, a, a knee jerk. Nope, don't wanna talk about it. That's, that's the way you get proliferation among allies is when you don't even want to talk about it. Um, but there are lots of things we could do short of, of, of that end of the spectrum of, of, of options. Um, for instance, three NPRs, three nuclear post reviews uh, starting in 2010 said we maintain the capability to globally deploy dual capable aircraft, the kind we have in Europe, the kind we have in, in some NATO nations. Um, we've never demonstrated that. Um, so, I mean, there are things you can do short of all the way to the end. So I think it's another one of those examples of um, the dynamic nature of all this, uh, different governments. When I said domestic politics uh, impact, um, which is the nuclear deterrence and assurance. Um, look, during the pot gun hate government, you know, there were a certain set of conversations. The moon government had a little different perspective on all this. The, a, a new conservative government, with, with President Yoon has come back in. So actually it wasn't unexpected to me that, that these kinds of issues would come up again. So um, it's part of the, it's, it's why you have to constantly have the discussions about who, who and what are you worried about? What are you worried about doing? And together, how do we deal with it? Again, don't, don't surprise each other. Um, uh, thank you guys for coming to speak to us. Um, I have a question for the general. You spoke extensively about um, the need for perfection in nuclear operations, but also the need to develop a new strategy. I was wondering if when developing a new strategy, would there be limits for mistakes? And if so, what will constitute a small mistake as opposed to a one that would damage relations long lasting. So let me just, let's talk about the um, standards that are involved in nuclear operations and, um, and how those standards are applied. And when I used to use the word perfection, um, you can misapply that. You can say, well, that means that if I'm taking a test in an academic setting, I have to get 100 or, or I fail. 
So, and, and some of our perfection standard was being applied that way. So there, there's a whole um, area here of activity in nuclear operations where in training, in evaluation, in, in uh, exercises, in, in things like that where um, people are not gonna perform perfectly and you want some mistakes to be made but in those areas, the consequences are not high. In field operations, when you're using, when you're working with the actual weapons, when you're working with the actual delivery systems, um, when you're in simulators, and when we are uh, practicing in simulators, then I think that standard gets to be far higher and perfection does become the standard. So I think when the consequences are highest, I think the standards apply at the highest level. Uh, and, and when they are not the highest, then, um, you know, I can tell you in the ICBM fields, almost every time before the crew force departs the support base to go out into the field for their duty, almost every time there's a test of some kind. If everybody's in a room like this, they're all getting briefed on what the weather is, what the road conditions are, what the threats are, and the whole, Thing that goes into that pre-deployment activity. And almost every time somebody says, but before you leave, here's a little quiz for you, a little pop quiz for you on some piece of their duty. And it is almost always on something that's of critical importance if they have to perform the, the launch mission as opposed to the monitoring and, and sort of control mission that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, thankfully, which is what we wanted to do. It. So sometimes we confuse those. Sometimes we would confuse how they did on that pop quiz, equate that to how you expect them to do if in fact we ever have to use these weapons. So we gotta make sure, commanders have to make sure you don't confuse those two things that people understand why they're being tested, what those tests mean, whether they're being used to determine whether you advance in your career or whether these are just opportunities for you to make some mistakes and learn from those mistakes. It's an academic environment as opposed to the operational environment. But in the operational environment, um, the consequences of, of mistakes there are enormous. And we have had some significant issues over time. Fortunately, not for many, many years. We've had some disasters, really. Uh, and and uh, you know, we've had some missiles explode. We've had airplanes crash. We've had all kinds of issues like that over the years. Not, you know, not recently, we don't operate that way anymore. And we've learned something from all of those. But I think that in those cases where uh, you and I are going into a missile launch control center or a missile silo to do maintenance on a missile, we must be perfect in the way we operate there. I have to know what you're supposed to do. You have to know what I'm supposed to do. We are watching one another to make sure we are executing our responsibilities correctly. And in those cases, perfection is the standard. Can I just add one thing? Um, because uh, Dr. Harvey talked about this with NC2. What General Kaler just spoke to about the forces is no less so, and even perhaps even more so, for the colonel on duty down in the National Military Command Center. I mean, they do the same kind of rehearsal. They, they then say, what did we do you know, perfectly? Where can we have improvement, et cetera? So it's not just the forces, it's also the incident. Yeah, Dr. I'm a student, an undergrad student at GW. I have two questions. Um, the first is related to, uh, to the organizational learning in new operations, as I know the uh, nuclear operations different from, uh, say, nuclear strategy or nuclear politics because it primarily involves a military organization. Although there are similar decisions to launch, uh, uh, the whole execution is from primarily from the military organization. And as as the general here said, like uh, the nuclear operations, we pursue the goal of perfection. But perfection demands the uh, the the, in, in the improvement. And and not only to like mechanical, mechanical, mechanically improve it, but also to set a perimeter. How do we assess uh, the, the improvements? How, how do we assess the problems? Uh, if you don't know the parameters, the organizational learning is it's not possible. Maybe you, you, in the wrong way, right? But 
uh, organizational learning usually happen like uh, when there are frequent like uh, employment uh, of organization like in real world tasks, but like in terms of neutral operations, like are primarily like um, tasks deterrence, like um, you don't get a chance to uh, really practice what after deterrence fail that you need to launch um, the whole thing. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's sort of a, a puzzling for me, like how does like um, say military, like US military as an organization improve its uh, practices and effectiveness and, and reach perfections through the organizational learning, even in an environment that um, like there is a real test. Thank you. And also, I forgot, I almost no, forgot. No. Yeah, no. one question is good. All right. Thank you. So one hallmark of nuclear duty is that there is a simulation world and there is a real world. In the simulation world, uh, which all three of the triad legs have, there are simulators that are, that uh, our crews uh, practice in and are evaluated in. Uh, those are pretty high fidelity simulators, and they get the opportunity there to practice the full range of their combat missions. In the real world, obviously, um, we we don't want them to practice that because uh, that that would mean we've gone to war. So, you you do as much in exercises and in the in the real world as you can, and uh, recognizing that there are limitations. Uh, our nuclear forces are inspected more frequently and with more intensity than any other military force that we have. Um, those that, that have been part of those forces will tell you that they're either finishing the last inspection or they're preparing for the next one. Uh, and uh, that's the level of intensity that is actually a psychological fact for those forces. So there's a simulation world. I can tell you again in ICBMs, I launched missiles in the simulator hundreds of times. I never launched one real one in on the test range. I never launched one real one. So I, I think that you just have to understand there are two differences here. Uh, and, and we do in the real world as much as we possibly can, but typically in the real world, um, there, there is uh, a, a line here. I'll also say that in the real world, uh, flying uh, long range bombers, uh, either dropping conventional ordnance or uh, in bomber task force missions like we've been doing around the globe here recently, that's pretty realistic. And th those tasks are pretty similar. Uh, in the SSBN force, just operating those complex machines uh, is, a, is a pretty daunting challenge for those crews. And so there is more transfer, I think, of the nuclear mission in the ballistic missile submarines and in the aircraft than there is in the ICBM force where the real world is really a completely different the real world in ICBMs is about security and maintenance. The real world uh, is not about launching missiles in those real uh, deployed units. That's all simulators. All right, I think we've reached our witching hour. So um, please join me in, in thanking the speakers for three really excellent talks.